Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, also Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. And today I'm going into a subject in, in, in about as deep as you can get into it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as uh, we often refer to this, the sealing of God, the Spirit of God, or I would actually say uh, the sealing of his divine love in your soul. How do you receive the Holy Spirit like that? How do you receive the divine love of the Father? And, of course, this makes you that new creature, that new creation. And it's it's a vital uh, part of who we are as Christians and who we become. And it also is what gives us the ability to leave this life and escape um, all the hor horrible things that are coming upon this world. Uh, so I want to get into that with you. I'm going to take you in very deep, but at the same time, I'm hoping for this to be very simplified as well, that you may be blessed by it. You're going to discover some things you've never probably heard before. Uh, we'll be getting into you know, because there's different people that believe, for example, well, you have to speak in tongues in order to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll get into those different issues there and kind of clarify that up. You'll be looking also in the Hebrew Matthew, because in the Hebrew Matthew, there is an amazing insight that is not found in the Greek Matthew at all. And it also is dealing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the, the very breath of God being breathed into your soul. And I want to share with you how to, how to receive that, how to seek for the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and, and hopefully it will change and, and really just alter your life altogether. So before we get started on this particular message, I think it'd be a great idea that we pray together about this because it's a serious message. And, uh, and I'm trusting will be a true blessing for you. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you just as sincerely as we know how. Because what we have need of and what the people have need of, Father, that will hear this message, Lord, is to know how to receive your love, the divine love of our Father, as we often refer to as the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. It's what quickens us and makes us one with you. It was, it's what makes us one creature. It's what fulfills your word where you said, in that day you will know that I am in you and you are in me and I am in the Father and the Father is in me. What a beautiful mystery that is, but yet so simple and so easy to receive. And so we ask, Father, that you would just help us, Lord, to understand and to believe and to know how to receive this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's get started here. <clears throat> like I said, it's going to be a very interesting path we're going to go down here. So I just ask you to bear with me. Uh, we're going to start right here in the book of Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, so I am going to be taking and sharing with you the screen where you can see this for yourself. Um, it says here, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Now let's go over to Galatians here as well. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you, uh, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, a new creature, right? This is what we need to be aware of, because we're to be a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus, and the only way that that happens is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or the love of God living within our own souls there, and so as we look at the Word of God here, like I said, you know, some of these things seem, they'll, they'll seem simple, but yet at the same time, I want to dig deep with you before we really get into knowing how to receive the Holy Spirit. 
this kind of look at what the Word of God has to say on multiple issues regarding this, so it kind of makes sense for us here. I want to jump into Ephesians chapter 2, and the reason I'm doing this too, because if you notice, like when we look here at Galatians, Galatians, you know, you know, Paul speaking here, you know, circumcised keep, you know, for, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. In other words, those he's talking about, you know, because you got to remember Paul's during the days of when he's in Israel and he's still dealing with most of the people there that are following the law. But he's telling you they don't even keep the law, but the desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. And, and he may be dealing with the Jewish people that were believers because there was that contention going on that they had to be circumcised and stuff. And, of course, that was not really the case. They didn't have to follow these laws that they were doing. And so we get into those type things there. And I, so I want to kind of address that as well, because that law is not, that's not what's going to save you. It's, it's, you need to truly be born again. You've, when I say being born again, you have got to be filled with that love of the Father himself, the Holy Spirit, actually entering into your soul. It's, it's I, I hate to be rude when I say it like this, you know, but it's truly like conception itself, you know, when when a when a child when a man and a woman they come together to make a child, there has to be in the in the natural to make a physical body, there has to be that union. And once they come together, that makes a another human body totally separate from that from that husband and wife, totally separate from them. It makes a whole new being, all right? And then what happens is, as I've gone before, I've talked about the redemption story, the redemption process that has to happen. There was there was a process of redemption. There was a fall that took place in the Garden of Eden. And when that fall came, there was a cutoff of, of humanity that got cut off from God. And... As a result, Christ had to come down to repair what had happened there. And the human beings were being born on the earth. Their souls were coming into this earth. They were coming into human bodies, but yet they had not received the Holy Spirit that would quicken that soul, that would make the soul. Because see, the, the real you is, is your soul. It's not your physical, it's not this part right here. This is not the real you. This part here is not the real you. This is just what we see of you. Your soul is who you really are. And that soul is what's got to be quickened by the Spirit of Almighty God. And His Spirit is perfect love. And when His Spirit comes inside of you, inside of your heart, by you opening up your heart, to him and and seeking him to seek the, the the true love of the father that divine love that is beyond anything to come inside of you that's then what quickens you and then what happens just like the child that is formed from a marriage union there that that child is totally separate from the mother and the father and then when when the holy spirit literally comes inside of your heart you become your soul then becomes truly one with the Father and as just like a brand new creation. Yeah, your body will still be there, but something will change inside of you. And we're going to get into all of that today. So let's take a look at what it says here. Okay, so they, so he's talking about, so he's showing you here, you know, but, but it's a new creature. For, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. So with, 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 with Jesus, it didn't matter which one you are there, but it's that new creature. It's that new creature in Christ Jesus. All right, so let's take, we're going to look over here at Ephesians here. And uh, so I'm going to change the screen here. You bear with me here so you can see the whole thing here. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, 
even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both into God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. All right? He slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off unto them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Let's, let's pay close attention to these things right there. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon a foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. All right. Hey, now, oh, wow, this is, I mean, this is amazing to me. I mean, absolutely amazing. Because why? All right, watch what he says there. Let me just back up for you. He abolished he abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Enmity is the enemy. It's an enemy. All right, and he abolished that in his flesh, the enmity. And what is the enmity? The law of commandments contained in ordinances to... to for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So in order to get rid of the enmity, he has to destroy that enmity, that hatred. Literally, the word enmity is hatred. And he, and he tells you what it is. It's the law and commandments. Now, if you look at Genesis, we can see where exactly what he's talking about here, all right? And so let me just take and we'll jump over here. We'll make the screen big for you to be able to see this a little bit better. Notice in Genesis chapter 3, verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you from among all cattle, and from among all the beasts of the field. And upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And right there in purple, notice what I have highlighted there, right? This is what's important that you see that. Um, give me one second here, trying to make everything work the way it's supposed to. Well, I'm actually on it, don't even realize it. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now, Jesus just told you in Ephesians, or Paul writes about this, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So in order to make peace, he had to abolish in his flesh the enmity of the law. All right, and then we find here where the enmity is. I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. I, I mean, do you guys realize what he's saying there? He's literally telling you that, he's, that there's going to be hatred between you and the woman, the serpent and the woman, and between your seed, the serpent's children, and her seed. Now, I actually have to add something here to be able to really make that stick. So let's go to Matthew 23. And, and some of these, like us, these are things we've gone over many times before. But we have to get down here to this so you see it, right? Now, Jesus says, let me back up a little bit. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. He said, wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets, fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation, and that's literally family of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? All right. <laughs> 
He, now he just told them. If we'd been in the days of our prophets, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. But now he's telling them that your father's the devil. Uh, actually, let me see. I think there's something like that, right? You appear righteous with it. You're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Um, I forget where that was at there. But 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 the whole point is he identifies them with the with a serpent generation. What did we have here in Genesis? There's going to be hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, your children. Now, you can apply that spiritually. I'm okay with that. I know because that's, that's a very touchy subject for people. So I don't care. If you want to apply that spiritually, I'm fine with that. Uh, if you want to look at Genesis 6, and what took place there. And if you want to go into Ezra chapter 9. Where they mingle the seed with the Nephilim races there. Which were reptilians. We still end up with the same thing no matter which way you go. So it doesn't matter which way you want to do it. You still end up with reptilians. Now the thing is. The, the word of God said that there was going to be an enmity between the woman and and the serpent, and between her seed and his seed. And Jesus identified in Matthew 23 that the Pharisees were serpents. They were a generation of vipers. And they hated Jesus. See, if I'm not mistaken, I think the scripture says they hated him without a cause. Um, let me just see if I can find that there for you, just so we kind of bring that out. Hated, and let me just see if that brings that up. Yeah, here it is, John 15, 25, right there. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. There you go. They hated him. Now, let me bring it back over here. You generation of vipers, right? There you go. And then, again, you drop back into Ephesians. He having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. All right, that, listen, this is where the problem came in to start with. It, the law itself is what created the hatred. And this is what they did with Jesus. They, they were constantly trying to find places using the law to trip him up. So if he abolished in his flesh the hatred, even the law of commandments, and so now, I mean, literally, that's what Paul is telling you. The enmity is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So he had to abolish that in his flesh to get rid of it, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And that's what he does. And of course, like I said, that enmity is written right here in Genesis. And then it says, now it doesn't, I actually have this highlighted in black. They wrote they, when in Hebrew it says he, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. All right, so, and when Christ was crucified, that's when he bruised the head of the serpent. That's when he destroyed that enmity. And by doing so, he broke up the law. Now, and you've got to break, here's the thing, in order for, in order for there to become a, recon, a reconciliation, in order for there to come uh a redemption what happened in the garden had to be corrected and Christ came and did exactly that and that's what makes and paves the way for you to receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit now let me let me before we get into this let me take you over to Hebrews excuse me uh, the Hebrew Matthew chapter 7 and 
this is one I've, I've actually said, I used to, I normally tell you guys, you got to really think deep about this, right? But there's something I caught in here that I've not caught before, and I wanted to bring this to your attention. So that's why we're going to go to this here. And it, and it really, is, what's interesting, it has to do um, with what we're talking about. I mean, in fact, let me, let me, I'll read this and I'm going to, I'm going to look up. I need to find the scripture for you. I forgot to put it up here about where Jesus says, your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and they're every one dead, right? We're going to go to that. Who is there among you whose son ask him for a piece of bread and he gives him a stone? Or if he should ask for a fish, he gives a snake. But if you being evil come to, to come to place good gifts before yourselves, so much the more your father who is in heaven will give his good spirit to those who seek him. Now, in the that, this is I mean that just blew me away right there, right? I, I think in the Greek it says give good gifts unto their unto his children, which is exactly what the father is talking about. He's talking about because you have to understand it's all about the manna, right? That's why I want to get into that. But let me just first take you over here in the Hebrew side of this, and we'll look at that real quick. There, we're in we're in verse eleven here. Um, there it is, right there. Ruachov, the Spirit Hatov. It doesn't let me highlight more there. I was hoping it would, but it's oh wow, isn't that weird? It just kind of skips skips over the very word. That was really weird. All right, so he would be, give his good spirit, hatov, ruach hatov, and that's literally, and not just the word tov, it's hatov. If you understand Hebrew, you'll really understand what that significance is right there. The the letter hey, and it's not letting me highlight that at all, which that really drives me nuts. Um, let me highlight the two here, all right? The one in the middle right there, that word right there in the middle is hatov. There is the first letter that's on the right hand side of that is the letter he. That is a definite, it's what we call a definite article in Hebrew. And when you say hatov, that is, I don't know how to explain that in English as well, but that's like saying the good. It is, it is the, the pure, it is the number one of all good. So when it's his good spirit, is what it's saying, his good spirit, um, to those who seek him. So the Father himself, if you were to ask him, that's why he says, so much more your Father who is in heaven will give his good spirit to those who seek him. But the thing is, though, is why is it what is it about, though? Why is that being brought up in an issue of a story about the manna in the wilderness? I mean, you really think about that one. That's why I say this is very deep. Because when Jesus says to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, etc., all those that were there, he's, you know, he said, uh, everyone who asks will receive by, by the one who seeks it will be found. And to, you know, and he's showing you right there before you even get there. Ask from God and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Oh my gosh. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Who is there among you whose son asks him for a piece of bread and, and, and he gives him a stone? Or if he should ask for a fish and he gives him a snake? But if you being evil come to place good gifts before yourselves, so much more your Father who is in heaven will give his good spirit to those who seek him. Wow. All right, now, I said I wanted to bring this out to you. Let me, let me go back over here. We were talking about, uh, you know, manna, and let me put the word dead because I think that's, oh, wait a minute, I got to spell with two N's. All right, yeah, John, John six. Actually, let's go to six forty nine. I'm gonna actually pull that one up. May, maybe I have it up already. Let me just see. 
Yeah, I'm actually already in chapter six right there. All right, so um, let me go back down and see what verse that was in that we were starting at. 49 and 58. I'm way back up here at 33. All right, so I know I got to go down then. All right, so we're already there. So let me just, let's let's just, uh, all right, I'm going to get you on the big screen here so you can see the whole thing for yourself. All right, for, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not, and that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day and this is the will of him that sent me that every one which seeth the son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day the Jews murmured at him because he said I am the bread which came down from heaven think about that one right they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, who father and mother we know? How is it that he saith, I come from, come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the father, which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard, hath learned of the father comes unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save, save he which is of God. He has seen the Father. And verily I say unto you, He that believes on me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he will shall, uh, shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. All right. Now just think of what Jesus is saying there, right? Just think of what he's saying. It is absolutely in my opinion, is absolutely amazing. So, he is that bread of life. Now, he's referring, though, going back into the book of Numbers, he's referring right here, as we've spoke about before, and it actually stems, with, it begins over here in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5, we, where, where the Israelites were re reminiscing. We remember the fish which were wont to eat in Egypt for naught, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But how our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all. We have nothing save this manna to look to. All right. Now, they were complaining about the manna, but yet they would eat the manna. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, there was something about the manna that was very special, no doubt about it. But Jesus is letting you know that manna was not giving you eternal life and then you end up with the situation on top of it because they were complaining about that we read here in numbers 21 the people spoke against god and against moses it was all because of speaking about the, the fish wherefore have you brought us up out of egypt to die in the wilderness for there is no bread there is no water and our soul loathes this light bread <laughs> oh gosh and the Lord sent fiery serpents by the way that's flying serpents you can translate it fiery but flying is the proper way seraphim is where it comes from the hanashim haseraphim and by the way the flying serpents is not the same as when he asked about taking away the serpent either 
And this is what's going to be important because this goes back, going back to Ephesians and Galatia, I believe Ephesians. Let me just real quick look at that. Remember the enmity, even the law, having abolished in his flesh, enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. All right. Keep that in mind as we look at this one here. And they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Now, remember what Jesus said. Which one of you being evil, your son asked for him, asked, uh, his father for a fish, would he give him a serpent? They were asking, they were just remembering the fish. Not even asked, just remembering. And they ended up with a bunch of fiery serpents, or flying serpents, actually. And they bit them, and much of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he will take away. Now they put in here the serpents from us. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. Me'alenu et chanachash. Take away the serpent from ruling over us. What? This, and by the way, this is where all the law came from, too, is while they were in that wilderness journey. And, you know, listen, Paul says it was a schoolmaster. Sure it was. It was a temporal law that was put in place, but it's a law with no mercy. And a law cannot give you the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus even says, they ate the manna, but they're all dead. He had to, when he died, he went to the other side and had to preach to those souls that were down there imprisoned so that they would know how to receive the Holy Spirit and come up and be and come up in the resurrection. Just like on the day of Pentecost, they had to receive the Holy Spirit as well. I know that may sound crazy to say it, but it's true. And and that the et hanachash, all you gotta do is go back to Genesis right there, right? And when you get with the serpent, and the Lord God said unto the serpent. There it is right there. Ve'yomer Yehovah Elohim El Chanachash. There it is right there, right there at the very end here. Right? And it's that last word right there, the one I just highlighted in blue for you. Chanachash. It's the serpent. So the same serpent that was in the Garden of Eden is the same serpent over here in the book of Numbers. Me'aleinu, ve'aser, me'aleinu, erchanachash. They wanted to have not serpents, but the serpent. And I, I actually translate, I would translate that from ruling over us. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make you a fiery serpent, or a flying serpent, a winged serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he seeth it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass. Brass represents judgment. There you, there's your law. And set it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he looked unto the serpent of brass, he lived. <laughs> wow. That is crazy. You know? I mean, it, it. when I say crazy, you have to understand, law is no mercy. There was a temporal placing of the law, but it was something that was going to have to be abolished. Because why? It was the enmity... Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself twain one new man, so making peace. The only way to make peace was to do away through the crucifixion. It was to do away with that enmity, that hatred, the hatred that had come between man and God. And he had to do away with that in his body. So he had to, he had to bring that down. And that enmity we see in Genesis. That's how you know what it is. That enmity was going to be between the woman and the serpent and also between her seed and the serpent's seed. And I just showed you that Jesus identified them 
as descendants of the serpent. And then you have that enmity or that hatred. What's between her and them? They hated him. They, they, as, as we just read over there in, in the book of John, they hated him without a cause. But their hatred was through the law. They felt like he didn't keep the law. Remember when he when they bring to him the woman, they caught her in a, in the very act of adultery, and they said we caught her in the very act of the adultery. And Moses said in the law that such a one should be put to death. Well, where the guy? Where was the guy that she was caught with then? Because according to the law, you're to put them both to death, not just the woman. But no, they drugged the woman out. They wanted to bring the guy out, but they brought her out. And Jesus says, which one of you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. Oh, that drove them nuts. See? See that hatred? They hated him because they couldn't defeat what he was saying. Jesus knew that what they needed was the Holy Spirit to come inside of their heart to quicken them and change their soul so that that would cause them to think differently, to act differently. That's what we need today. We need the love of Almighty God inside of our hearts, inside of our souls, the very depth of who we are, to change us from being from, from that hatred because the law creates a hatred. And as long as you cling to the law, you will, you will never have peace with God. You'll never be able to have peace, true peace and everything because you put the law between you and God. And you're still living like a Pharisee. You know, this is why I'm trying to bring this stuff out to you, friends. See, and then and then Jesus shows you right there, even in the Hebrew Matthew, he shows you, you being evil, you know how to give a good gift to your kids, but <laughs> but if you being evil come to a place good gifts before yourselves, so much the more your father who is in heaven will give his good spirit to those who seek him. That's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. Now, so we went into that, the bread, right? Let's go over to the book of Hebrews chapter 8. All right, now. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been found for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and to them shall be to me a people. Now, the one thing I want you to, to see here when we look at this right here. Because some people will say, oh, but brother, you know, we can't do away with the law and stuff. When God places his Holy Spirit within your heart, the law of God now is what is in you. You don't have a need for a thou shalt not law anymore. Even Jesus said about the Ten Commandments, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And he said, and all the law hangs on those two. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal, you're not going to covet, you're not going to take and commit adultery. You, know, you see what I'm saying? You wouldn't do those things in the first place. Same thing if you love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. You're not, gonna, you're not going to, to forsake those things because now they're within your heart. And he says that he's going to write, he's going to put them, lead them out of the, you know, he led them out of Egypt. For if that first covenant, this is what's important though, if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. That's another interesting fact. If the law is that perfect, then why did Christ have to come? Why is it prophesied that there would be a new covenant? 
And he does make the promise that he was going to make this covenant. And if you'll notice, he makes it with the house of Israel after those days. And this is where a lot of people think, well, they're waiting for that law to come out of Jerusalem because we got 10 lost tribes and they totally forget the book of Acts. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a Russian mighty wind and filled all the house where they were all sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire that sat upon each of them. By the way, notice that. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It wasn't that they were speaking in unknown tongues. It's, uh, it was like, in other words, like a little fire, a light of fire that appeared over them. And it looked like a tongue. I guess like the shape of a tongue. That would be shaped similar to the heart. The tongue kind of resembles a little bit like the human heart. All right, and it was it was hanging over them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's where some people believe it's an unknown tongue, right? Other tongues, but we're going to find out what the other tongue is because it answers it right here in the very chapter. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews. Devout, that's actually, by the way, that word in Greek is Judeans. Dwelling at Jerusalem, Judeans, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised, ab noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue or his own language. Now, that answers up here. When they spoke with other tongues, as the Spirit had given them utterance, and then we find here because that that every man heard them speak in his own language. So that other tongue they were speaking were just other languages of those nations. It wasn't even an unknown tongue. It was their languages. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? The miracle here is they were speaking in those languages. So if let's say one of the guys was from, uh, uh, what well, we know where they're from, it tells you right where they're from. They were uh, from Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Libya, Cretes, Arabians. Let's say they were from Arabia. Maybe they spoke Arabic. And yet they're speaking in Greek there. But when they have this tongue that they're able to do, there was somebody speaking in Arabic or whatever that language was, and that's how they heard it. This is what's amazing, right? That's what's amazing right there. So, at any rate, we come here, now I want to take you over here into John chapter 20. Or let me go back to Acts. I didn't finish in Acts here. Let me take you down to verse 36 here. I believe that's where it is. Because if you remember what we said here, that he says here, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Right? That's receiving the Holy Spirit. And then when we get down here to verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who? The house of Israel. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see there? They just needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins and they would receive the Holy Spirit. That was the house of Israel. All right? And so I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. So when you receive the Holy Spirit within your soul, in your heart, you receive the law of Almighty God. That's what happens. All right? And this is what's so vital. 
So when John, when we read over here, this is after the resurrection, right? Jesus comes and he says, says here, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, then when the were disciples were glad. Now this, this is before the day of Pentecost, right? And when they saw the Lord, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. He breathed on them. And again, it goes right back to Genesis. Okay? Genesis, in this case here, instead of the fall, it's going back to chapter 2. See, when God first made that man, and he breathed in his nostrils, all right, he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know how many times in the scripture it says every tree is known by its fruit? Jesus Christ was the tree of life, the Eitz Chaim. If he breathed Chaim into the nostrils of Adam, he was breathing the, the fruit of the tree of life, which would be the Holy Spirit into him. When you come over here into John, that's why Jesus breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Restoring what was lost at the beginning. And when you receive the very love of God himself, which is the Holy Spirit, into your soul, you are taking in the very life of Almighty God. You are, you are receiving the Chaim from the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. And how do you receive that? When you earnestly seek to God, I mean, I do believe you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I do believe that, as it says in the book of Acts. And by the way, that would be fulfilling Matthew 28, which, by the way, Matthew 28, for some strange reason, is not in the Hebrew Matthew when it talks about baptizing, when it says in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. I don't know why, but it's just not there. But even if you did, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? Well, Father's not a name, Son's not a name, and now there's Holy Ghost. But Jesus said, I come in my Father's name, right? And uh, so if he came in his Father's name, that's why they baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. So, but the point being here that I'm trying to make to you is, when you earnestly seek the Father with all of your heart and you tell him that you want his spirit, his love to enter into your heart and you stay before him seeking him like that, that you want the love of Jesus Christ to live inside of you, the love of the Father to truly baptize your soul. What you do is you're causing your soul to open up. And that's the only way. That's why Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. And that's what you have to do to receive eternal life. Straight is that gate, narrow is that way. And it's interesting that the word that is used there, straight, is like a body of water. It's not like a straight line, but like a body of water. That's one reason why I think tube water baptism does matter. But when you, and we know you don't have to be baptized necessarily to receive the Holy Spirit because there are those that receive the Holy Spirit. And then they said, can we forbid water to these here seeing as they have been filled with the Holy Spirit, right? It's amazing. Everything about his word is absolutely amazing. Absolutely. I want to thank you for listening today and I trust it's a blessing to you and I pray, I will be praying for you that you, if you have not received the Holy Spirit, that God will fill you with the Holy Spirit, that you will, that you will receive that love into your heart and that it will quicken you and make you a new creation completely to where the love of God will just permeate your every pore of your being. That's the type of love we all have need of. I want to thank you for listening again. If God lays upon your heart to support the work we do here, we appreciate it. We thank you for it. Always at the top of the video, as you can see, is our, is our website, israelinewslive.org, as well as our mailing address. 
and you can even donate right there online if God lays, like I said, if he lays that upon your heart to do so. We thank you for that. You could do that just by clicking the button right there under Donate Online. Thank you and God bless you and have a blessed day in the name of Jesus Christ.